Uh, my name is Davis Robinson. I'm on the executive committee of the Institute. And John Negroponte and I, we go back so many years, we don't really want at this moment to admit how many years it is, but it's almost 60 years. And um, we first met in a smoking room in a secondary school that was in the basement, and it, <coughs> and it was called the butt room. No windows whatsoever. This is the, uh, the mid-1950s. Uh, and there were cigar smokers, and there were pipe smokers, and there were cigarette smokers. And the one thing that I remember about about him at that uh, point in our lives was that when we played poker, he invariably won. And why did he win? Well, he won because he knew how to bluff the best of any of these young teenagers who wanted to play poker. So I've always felt that one of the reasons why he went on to such a really incredibly distinguished life was because of the poker games and the bridge games in the butt room of our secondary school. But John Negroponte, certainly in my generation, in our generation of foreign service officers, and I was a foreign service officer myself for several years, he is the most distinguished, has the most incredible record of any foreign service officer of our generation. I don't think there's anybody else who has come close to the number of senior, uh, senior appointments that he has had. I'll tell one other small personal story that I think is about right. He was assigned first to Hong Kong and I was assigned to Alexandria, Egypt. And when he came back, the Department of State wanted to assign him to the uh, personnel office in the department, which was really sort of the stroke of death if that's not an assignment that you really wanted. So as I understand it, he went and he pled <coughs> with the personnel office itself. Isn't there anything I can do that would be an assignment other than in the personnel office? And they said, well, if you want to, the only thing we can think of, would you take the Vietnamese language? which he hadn't thought about at all. And yes, indeed, I will certainly, I'm very happy to take <coughs> the Vietnamese language. So life being so random, that then led to one thing into another, and he ended up in Saigon as the aide to Henry Cabot Lodge, who introduced him to Avril Harriman, and so he's then in the Paris Peace Talks, who introduced him to Henry Kissinger, and it goes on and on. And um, his first ambassadorial post, as I recall, was in Honduras, and um, that actually, I think, uh, became one of the more controversial things in his lengthy career because of the Contras, and I was the legal advisor at that time. And he was the ambassador to Mexico, he was the ambassador to the Philippines, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, Environment, and Science at the time of the Gulf of Maine uh, negotiations, the Fisheries Agreement and the Boundary Agreement and the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, he went on then to become uh, the ambassador to the Philippines. He was the Deputy National Security Advisor. Uh, he was the first uh, the director of uh, national intelligence. As you know, in the United States, often when we have turf fights, the way to solve them has been not to solve them, but to create something new. So when the Commerce Department and the State Department and the Treasury Department were fighting over foreign trade, <laughs> what did John F. Kennedy do? He set up the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, so then then there were <coughs> four in the fight <coughs> rather than three. John was then made uh, the ambassador to Iraq, and his last uh, assignment was as the deputy secretary of state, <coughs> the number two in the department. So it's a real honor, and it is indeed a personal privilege to introduce this old, old friend 
who has had such a fabulous life. So I introduce you to John Edgar Davis with me wherever I give a speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Davis, very much. And let me uh, start out, uh, first of all, because uh, I don't want Ambassador Heather Hodges to get the wrong impression. Uh, I, I, I want to acknowledge her presence here. She's our former ambassador to uh, the country of Ecuador, and she now runs the World Affairs Council chapter here in the Cleveland area. But it was not the personnel office I got assigned to. Heather is a very distinguished former senior personnel officer in the Department of State. <laughs> it was, some inspector had the idea that I really would benefit by being what they call a post management officer. And so I was sent to the Bureau of African Affairs in 1963, and I was managing the North African Posts. And by managing, that means you decide, well, these ambassadors will remember, there's somebody who helps you send your household effects uh, to the post. And I was moving household effects around and stuff like that. And that's what caused me to go to see George Roberts, my personnel officer, and said, George, please help me get out of here. And then uh, the rest, uh, you, I think, uh, very accurately captured. But I just wanted to make that point because I happen to think that of all the management functions in government, and I have managed and overseen some pretty large organizations, including the intelligence community and the Department of State, I actually think the human resources function is probably the most important of the man managerial functions because you're nowhere if you can't get good people to help you accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. So I always valued uh, that activity uh, a great deal. I want to thank the, first of all, Davis for having initiated this invitation to me. And uh, I want to thank the uh, organizers of the conference, the Canada US Law Institute. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. Frankly, I was not uh, as aware as I perhaps should have been of the work that you do, and so I think this is a real eye-opener for me and something, something meaningful that I will take back uh, to my life back uh, in Washington. I want to say how delighted I am to see uh, both the, uh, the current and uh, prior ambassadors of the United States to uh, Canada, and uh, uh, delighted that they're here today, and I want to thank uh, everybody else for uh, being involved and to uh, the number of Canadian friends, some of whom I've uh, uh, renewed acquaintance with after uh, a, a certain period uh, of time. Um, I, before I, I had a, I have some prepared remarks, but before I do, I wanted to try and give them a little bit of context, maybe if we can move to the uh, number of millimeters in a creamery jar or whatever it was for, uh, to talk a little bit about the global context of, of United States uh, foreign policy, because I think it's important to say that we've emerged from, from a very difficult decade, the period 2000 to 2010, uh, with these two wars, uh, which are not yet fully resolved by any means, one uh, less so than the other, a financial crisis that has really uh, uh, put our uh, economy in a very challenging situation. And so I think uh, in, in summary terms, one could say that the, uh, the epithet or the characterization of sole remaining superpower, which uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright used in the 1990s, is, is clearly uh, no longer apt. And I think we find ourselves uh, in a period of some question back home and some self-doubt as to exactly, and I think people also around the world are looking at us and saying, well, you know, what is the role of the United States going to be in the world uh, going forward in the future? Are we, what kind of uh, place are we going to have over the next uh, couple of generations? I always like to say it's a little bit like Mark Twain's uh, famous epithet about uh, rumors 
uh, of my death are premature, and I think that that's probably uh, what one could also say about the United States role in the world. I think there's an awful lot going for the United States. It uh, is today and will be in the year 2050 uh, still the third most populous country in the world. And it's certainly going to be either the largest or the second largest uh, economy in the world. I think its uh, entrepreneurial system uh, and its uh, innovativeness give it a great deal uh, uh, to uh, commend it. And I think that uh, perhaps uh, a factor that we don't think about that much, but when you look at the China one-child policy and you look at the aging of Europe and then you look at the U.S. Uh, demogra demographic uh, picture, we are certainly, and I think this can be probably said, I've never studied it in detail about Canada as well, the replenishment of our youthful population uh, is really quite dynamic. So. Uh, I challenge my own students when I teach, I teach uh, part-time at Yale University, and I will say, well, try to imagine what things will be like in the year 2050. I mean, uh, it's not so far off. It certainly doesn't, uh, 50 years back doesn't look, or 40 years back doesn't look like that long a time ago to me. And so you've got you to gotta challenge yourself in that same way looking forward. And, and I think we can look forward to a fairly bright future, provided uh, we do a couple of things. And I think probably the two most important ones are first of all putting our own fiscal house in order, at least coming up with a plan that puts us on a trajectory, if you will, to put our house in order, say, over a 10-year period, a period of time that's uh, reasonably well-defined, and then if we can get onto that track. And the other is, I think, that as far as uh, international engagements are concerned, that uh, I don't see us uh, mounting any large 150 or 100,000 strong expedition to some far-flung part of the world uh, in the foreseeable future. I think we're going to have to be more measured with regard to the international, particularly the, uh, the uh, military engagements uh, that we undertake. And I think, uh, and very much uh, along the model that President Obama has suggested to us, we're going to have to take more multilateral approaches. We're going to have to do more with uh, other countries that are uh, uh, willing partners. And that, I think, is going to put an even greater premium on alliances, uh, strong bilateral relationships, close friendships. We're going to have to be more mindful of all of these factors as we try to carry out our objectives uh, both around the world uh, and in our uh, own uh, neighborhood. So that brings me, of course, to the discussion about the United States-Canada relationship, which I believe in that context is going to be uh, even more important uh, in the decades ahead than it has been in the decades past. And I uh, entitled my remarks uh, uh, A Partnership for Regional Prosperity uh, and global peace. Now, I recognize that this is an ambitious topic, but I selected it for a very specific purpose, and that is to highlight the broad and multifaceted and holistic nature of United States-Canada relations. The U.S.-Canada relationship is not just any relationship. It reaches into many spheres of human endeavor and touches many parts of the globe. It touches uh, not just on our common bo border area, but extends to the farthest corners of the world. We sometimes take for granted the extraordinarily friendly and productive nature of our relations. We need only imagine for a few moments a different scenario where our relations were antagonistic, maybe even to the point of having to arm our respective sides of the border to appreciate the blessings of the peaceful border that we do have. My own experience with the government of Canada goes back a long way. Indeed, my first recollection of meeting Canadian officials 
was in Vietnam in the 1960s when Canada served on the Three Nation International Control Commission, which supervised the 1954 peace accords on Indochina. I was a political officer in our embassy in Saigon at the time and from time to time had the opportunity to meet with Canadian military and civilian officers charged with overseeing the ill-fated 1954 truce. Ill-fated as it may have been, imprinted on my mind from those days forward was the seriousness of Canada's commitment to peacekeeping and peace monitoring in the most far-flung places of the world. A more in-depth exposure to Canada came in the late 1970s when I was named Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and Fisheries with responsibility for revising and renewing fisheries agreements with other fishing countries in light of the recent extension by the majority of coastal states of their fisheries jurisdiction from 12 to 200 miles off their respective coasts. Because of the continu contiguity of United States and Canada, our respective 200 mile claims overlapped and had to be sorted out by negotiation. Perhaps the most notable case was the Gulf of Maine dispute, which at the time was a major bone of contention between us. So much so that our leaders selected special envoys to negotiate a solution. On our side, the negotiator was Lloyd Cutler, a noted Washington lawyer who later became White House counsel. I was privileged to assist Mr. Cutler in my capacity as Deputy Assistant Secretary. Our counterpart was Ambassador Marcel Cadieu, a legendary figure in Canadian diplomacy. Well, as it turned out, we were unable to resolve, to finally resolve the matter by negotiation, and in the end, it was settled by arbitration, thereby disposing of one of the more significant irritants in, ma in the management of our bilateral ties. Today, the Gulf of Maine case is but a boring and almost forgotten footnote in the history of United States-Canada relations. But believe me, at the time, uh, it was one that excited considerable interest and I would say even passion on both sides of the border. My fisheries experience with Canada was not limited to negotiating about ownership of scallops in the Gulf of Maine. One very cold winter in Juneau, Alaska, Ambassador Cadieu and I negotiated a joint fishing agreement over Pacific halibut. It was something like 30 below zero Fahrenheit and the wind was blowing so hard it was a challenge to get in and out of the negotiating site. And in, in, in other talks, of course, we also negotiated endlessly about salmon. Atlantic salmon, Pacific salmon, Fraser River salmon, Bristol Bay sockeye salmon, you name it. I learned more about the life cycle of various marine species in that job than I ever thought I would. In the mid-1980s, I returned to that same Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science, this time as its director, and graduated to working on even a wide array wider array of bilateral and multilateral issues with Canada. For example, acid rain and what to do about the sulfur emitting coal-fired power plants in the Ohio Valley, which, was, uh, which were causing dieback to forests on the Canadian and U.S. eastern seaboard. The International Space Station and bringing Canada on as a partner to build the arm, the so-called arm of the space station. And perhaps most importantly, the landmark 1987 Montreal Protocol to protect the stratospheric ozone layer. I think it's a fitting tribute to Canada's leadership on international environmental matters that the most 
important agreement to curb greenhouse gases thus far, and I, I think, like many others, share the disappointment that there hasn't been any further <laughs> agreement on greenhouse gases since 1987, but that the most important agreement to curb greenhouse gases thus far was signed in Canada. Not long after working, uh, oh, by the way, on environmental issues, the uh, Coast Guard uh, colleague here, officer, mentioned earlier the question of invasive species, and I asked him afterwards whether the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission still existed, and I was reassured to know that that's one part of our bureaucracy that still survives, and uh, the big challenge then, and as I gather it is now, is dealing with the lamprey eel. I don't know how many of you know about the lamprey eel, but the only way it can be killed is by a very intelligent German uh, uh, chemical called lampricide, and that's the way it's kept under control. And I used to have to go up, I don't know how this happened to devolve upon the State Department, but I had to go up and defend every year a multi-million dollar line item to buy lampricide from Germany <laughs> to provide to the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, and I gather that still continues. Not long after working on the Montreal Protocol, I was transferred to the White House to become Deputy National Security Advisor under Colin Powell. One of my most vivid uh, recollections uh, from that, uh, one of my most vivid m moments in that position was on January 2nd, 1989, when we went to br in to brief, uh, General Powell and I went in to brief President Reagan on the United States-Canada Free Trade Agreement, the FTA which he was about to sign in a video uh, uh, conference uh, ceremony. This is after the uh, ratification process on both sides had been completed. And he was about to sign it in a video conference ceremony with Prime Minister Mulroney. And so, as instructed by General Powell, I began, uh, I launched upon a set of talking points uh, extolling the virtues of the agreement. But I would not gotten, gotten very far before the President interrupted and gently uh, put me in my place by remarking, and this is uh, probably almost a verbatim quote, he said, oh, you don't have to remind me of the benefits of free trade. I remember the Smoot-Hawley tariff. <laughs> <laughs> What are you going to do? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> uh, one of the most uh, intense periods in my diplomatic life was serving as United States Ambassador from, to Mexico from 1989 to 1993, which was the time of the conception and negotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Looking back at that period, I think it was one of exceptional strategic cooperation between our three countries and from which we have all benefited in the ensuing 20 years. While the agreements were negotiated between our respective trade negotiators, ambassadors played an important behind-the-scenes role. And David Winfield was the uh, Canadian ambassador to Mexico at that time, and we became very close partners and friends, I should add, in our common enterprise. I thought our working relations were a model of its kind, and I will always be grateful to David for the friendly cooperation he extended to me during the course of what at times was a very challenging uh, negotiation, and I uh, would like to think that I reciprocated to the best of my ability, and, and I, I'd like to add here one thought uh, about the NAFTA, which is uh, a reflection on, on what it might have, that negotiation might have meant to Canada. I'm not sure there was that much interest in Mexico on the part of Canada prior to the NAFTA negotiation, and I think that in some respects it was a bit of an eye-opener and I think even, as a practical matter, can be pointed to as something that generated a, a, a spike in uh, Mexico-Canada, Canada-Mexico trade in the ensuing years. So I think it was a, a positive uh, development in that regard uh, as well. 
uh, moving, oh, and by the way, I mean, we had so many problems with Mexico. You, you really brought back memories today when the previous panel was talking about phytosanitary measures and agricultural imports and exports. Um, I had somebody in the embassy there in Mexico City who worked for the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, APHIS. And I said, now what about these uh, avocados? Why can't, why can't I buy any uh, whole avocado, Mexican avocado in the United States? I mean, what's, what's wrong here? He said, oh, it's the weevil. I used to call it the evil weevil because I, <laughs> it's the weevil. And it just can't get through. It's just going to pestiferate our whole agricultural setup over there in the United States. I said, oh, but what if we try to find some way to change that? Is it, I mean, is it a manageable issue? And he said, well, scientifically, it may be manageable. And then I said, why don't we work together and see if we can make some proposals to Washington as to how to change it? He said, oh, that's too political. So here I had the scientist <laughs> telling me <laughs> how political things were. But I'm pleased to see that in American supermarkets now, you can buy uh, avocados in abundance. Uh, you can also buy uh, mangoes, which you couldn't get in those days too, because back then you had to dip it in some kind of uh, hot liquid with a chemical in it, and that would of course ruin the texture uh, of the uh, mango as we killed uh, probably some other evil weevil. Uh, I don't know exactly. Oh, it was a fly. I think it was some kind of a fly. So, you know, I, my, uh, I, I heard a bit of deference and respect being expressed towards these kind of scientific regulators, and I, I share that view. One must be respectful. But at the same time, I, it never hurts to ask questions. That would be uh, my added thought <laughs> to that <laughs> proposition. I once confronted, as we were trying to promote the NAFTA, a group of tomato farmers in Florida. And we were about coming to closure on the NAFTA. And I said, you know, we're going to have to do this. And agriculture's on the table, in fact, at US insistence, because we stood to benefit from increased US agricultural exports. And uh, and they were complaining on this, and now we're going to be flooded by Mexican produce and everything. I said, well, the way we deal with that is to have transition periods. We'll have a 10-year phase in. You won't, it all, won't all happen right away. And uh, that, that'll, we think, uh, it provides an effective solution to the problem. And then I asked these farmers, they were farmers, <laughs> said, what, uh, what do you think a reasonable transition period would be? And there was dead silence in the room for about a minute. <laughs> And this one guy pops up in the back, he says, 50 years. <laughs> Moving fast forward to the penultimate and ultimate states of my government career, I was confirmed as our ambassador to the United Nations four days after 9-11. Over that following weekend, I made my way to New York, and the first a uh, diplomatic uh, colleague I saw was Paul Heinbecker, Canada's permanent representative to the United Nations. Indeed, we had dinner uh, that very first night that I was in New York because I had known Paul during his service at the Canadian Embassy in Washington and came to regard him as an experienced professional and as a trusted friend. And during our time in New York, Paul was always ready and willing to share with me his insightful assessments of the diplomatic la landscape in New York and his candid thoughts about how to deal with the challenges we confronted. And later, as Director of National Intelligence, and finally as Deputy Secretary of State, I was able to work with Canadian officials on both global issues, such as uh, the phenomenon of violent Islamic extremism uh, and all of those issues, as well as the preparation of our annual regional summits between the leaders of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Indeed, as Deputy Secretary of State, I was privileged to accompany President Bush to two of his SPP, the Security and uh, Prosperity Partnership uh, meetings with Prime Minister Harper and President uh, Calderon, one at Montebello, 
uh, and one in New Orleans, reference uh, New Orleans, or a reference was made to those meetings uh, earlier on. These experiences at the culmination of my time in government service confirmed to me what I had been learning gradually during the entire 44 years of my diplomatic career. Uh, first and foremost, we are neighbors, friends, and allies. It is difficult to imagine a more important relationship. And in that context, Canada plays an instrumental role which needs to be appreciated, an instrumental global role which needs to be appreciated, whether it is as a G7 country whose voice counts in global financial circles or as a strong NATO ally whose sons and daughters have been sent into harm's way in such far away places as Afghanistan. As a neighbor and partner also in regional cooperation, whether in NAFTA or the Western Hemisphere as a whole, Canada has made a substantial and consistent contribution. And it isn't just in recent years. I remember going back into the 1970s when Canada had taken on a kind of a special responsibility for the Caribbean region. And we, uh, I remember Phil Habib at one point, uh, one of my mentors in the Foreign Service, had been given the assignment of, of uh, working on uh, what, we, what more we could do to help the Caribbean Basin region. And one of the first places he came to was Ottawa to consult with Canada uh, about that. In this era of globalization, we must work together even more to enhance regional competitiveness. If we are to avoid uh, losing our edge to other parts of the world. Uh, taking uh, the NAFTA to the next level and uh, regulatory cooperation initiatives, I think, will be very important steps uh, in this uh, direction. And finally, we are both Pacific nations facing westward towards peoples and economies which hold great promise an opportunity for the future of this planet. We've only lightly touched upon the diverse facets of United States-Canada relations, but perhaps I can close with the following thoughts. U.S.-Canada ties are not transient. Specific issues may come and go, and they need to be dealt with in a spirit that behooves neighbors, friends, and allies. There may be irritants that need to be managed, but we must never forget that the relationship is a historic and enduring one, as enduring as any such relationship can be. And this relationship has repercussions at all three levels of our respective di diplomacies, the bilateral, the regional, and the global. So I think it's fitting that we nurture these ties carefully, that we not take our relationships for granted, and that we use occasions such as these to reaffirm the profound and enduring friendship between our two countries. Thank you. Question? Yeah, and the ocean, and the lakes. <laughs> we have, um, between our two countries, hundreds of working arrangements, protocols, um, memorandas of understanding. I can't remember the count. A research body did a count once. It was in the hundreds. Everything we've talked about this morning, there's cooperation among agencies, between provinces and states. The interesting thing about Canada and the United States is that there are very few treaties. There are very few. I, I'm struck by that. When, I, when I'm talking about treaties, I'm talking about treaties in the formal sense. Bilateral treaties. Bilateral treaties. <coughs> uh, there's the Boundary Waters Treaty, which was mentioned earlier, 1909. Uh, there is the NORAD Agreement 
1958, Columbia, Columbia River Treaty, the St. Lawrence Seaway Agreements dating from the 50s. The FTA original free trade agreement was negotiated, as you mentioned, in the 1980s. And the NAFTA really is a product of that. And the NAFTA is now uh, some 25, 26 years old. What I'm saying is for a generation, good generation and more, we haven't engaged in treaty making between the two countries. And I'm just putting the question to you, is that, is that a good thing? Good, bad, or indifferent, is right? Is it a good thing or not? Or does yeah. it really mean that two things, either the relationship is working so well that we don't need to have treaties to govern our relationship, or is it the political reality that you can't get treaties through the U.S. Congress anymore, mm -hmm. and so forget about going that route and try and work things out on a on a, a second tier of it. It's a it's a great question, and I think to do it justice, I probably have to think about it more and look back at myself at some of the documents and the record. But I think my my instinct, my intuition, would say. I don't think this is something to be lamented. I mean, I think it's, it's a demonstration that we are able to work things out uh, at a, a level less than the level of uh, formal agreements, if you will, or treaties. Sometimes you might have executive agreements or something like that, or implementation of other agreements. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's to be regretted. On the other hand, the other thought that crossed my mind as you were asking that question is that if you don't sometimes raise things to a certain level of formality, does it mean that you don't oblige yourself to think about the relationship as a whole? And you know, if, if you don't raise this to the senior government level and leave it to a lot of these informal arrangements, does the relationship necessarily get the kind of direction that it ought to get? Uh, so uh, you know that that's, I, I would I would pose that question, but let's face it: it really is easy for Canadians and Americans to deal with each other, and government officials to deal with each other. You're not even. I remember when we were negotiating the NAFTA, uh, one of the noted Mexican commentators came to me and said, "Well, can't we get an American area code?" as part of uh, the NAFTA, like Canada has. <laughs> um, in, in, with Canada, we can just go one and then your area code, I believe, your, your, your regional code. And I, you know, I, 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 I made a query about that and was told that this would be you know, harder than anything. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> I would just, uh, was one area of cooperation I didn't mention, uh, but uh, which I think I should, because I think it's very important. Sorry, Ambassador, but just one, uh, Governor, one, one thing. Intelligence. There's an incredibly important group uh, in our uh, international group. It's kind of a little fraternity. It's called the Five Eyes. And the Five Eyes in the intelligence community uh, are the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. It's almost as if Winston Churchill is still sort of watching over us here. Uh, but that was a group, uh, it exists, and it's the intelligence chiefs of each of these countries that meet with each other once a year in a kind of an informal and not obviously not particularly publicized uh, location or anything like that. And we go over everything. I mean, there's, there's nothing we don't talk about with each other. And uh, the level of confidence and trust at which we work uh, between our intelligence communities is, uh, is very impressive indeed. Sorry, Governor. No, given all your experience and background, I, I'd be interested, and I think a lot of people would, about when you look at history, I don't mean recent history, but the sweep of history, yeah. who are your heroes? And my other question is, what books have you read recently that you might recommend to us? <laughs> <laughs> well, books, I, since I teach at Yale, I'm trying to keep up with the books that I've assigned to my students all the time. <laughs> John Gaddis has just published a great uh, biography of George F. Kennan. Now, it is 699 pages, so uh, it, 
you know, it's got to be a long trip. But, uh, but it is so carefully written. And one of the reasons it's carefully written is that John worked out an agreement with Kennan that he would be his official biographer. And then Kennan said, but oh, by the way, and he worked that out in 1980. And, but then Kennan said, oh, by the way, you can't publish it until after I die. Well, John didn't count on George F. Kennan living to be 102. <laughs> <laughs> So he had a lot of time to work on it. But I, it really is a masterpiece of, his, of, of uh, biography. So I, I commend that one to you. Um, and if you're interested in uh, sort of the post-independence U.S. foreign policy, I think Robert Kagan's book, uh, Dangerous Nation, is a very, uh, very interesting book indeed. There's just some treatment there of uh, by Ben Franklin's uh, ambitions vis-a-vis -vis Canada and also I urge you to read those with a certain degree of uh, historical tolerance uh, but uh, it's 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 a very good book as well who's my hero uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, and uh, just for what he accomplished in uh, World War two Now, there must be further questions. <laughs> yes, please. I'll stand up if I can't get the microphone. Uh, this question has nothing to do with Canada and the United States, so it has nothing to do with trade and the economy, which is quite rare for me to ask. So I'm going to ask, um, ask a question anyways. But thank you for your kind words and your remarks, sir. Looking forward. Looking forward. Yeah, it's working. Got it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking forward. Um, um, the role of the traditional nation state, given the 24 hour, 24 seven hour news hour, social media, uh, strategic interests that are shifting from day to day. How do you see the uh, traditional role of the diplomatic corps in any country? Right. Um, and the fastness and quickness of decisions being made. Right. Um, <laughs> The answer to this question, I think, really depends on what part of the world you're talking about. Because Europe is so much farther ahead than anybody else in terms of uh, integration and of uh, melding uh, sovereignty and then getting it back in a different form through the arrangements that they have uh, made, that there's hardly any other place in the world that, that compares to it. And so it creates really this asymmetry, and it actually does go back to the issue of U.S.-Canada, U.S.-Mexico, <laughs> and other relations in the following sense. When we were debating whether or not to have a NAFTA, um, there were Mexicans, some of whom were sort of European-influenced intellectuals, who thought it ought to be more like an, a European Union type arrangement, including, they had in mind, the big subsidies that came <coughs> from the other countries that would help subvention their agriculture and everything else and income transfers and so forth. And to me, that doesn't conform really with the conception, I want to say it broadly, and it may be too big a generalization, but in North America, I don't think the nation states of North America look to that kind of integration or, or that kind of uh, devolving of their sovereignty to some, cent to some Brussels. Um, they really do, wait, big countries, huge amounts of territory, plenty of room to operate in. You don't have that crowded <laughs> feeling that like if you lean the wrong way, you're going to be in another country. Um, so I, I think there's a, a rather different attitude towards space, government, sovereignty, and, and everything else. So notwithstanding your comment about the speed of decisions and all of that, I think n nation states are alive and well in this hemisphere uh, by and large. And I, I think it's also true if you look at Brazil. Can you imagine Brazil thinking of itself as becoming, uh, subordinating itself to some kind of supranational body? So. It's a different culture in this part of the world. Europe is kind of unique in that regard. And then if you go over to Asia, my goodness. I mean, Asia doesn't, that's one of the frequent complaints about Asia. It, it doesn't even have the 
multinational or the international institutions to and framework with with which to to deal with different issues that might surface. They, obviously, what we're seeing now, the ASEAN, the APEC, the East Asia Summit, all these different mechanisms, none of which have any operate operational authority particularly or or decision making powers but you can see them gradually moving towards trying to find some kind of set of international structures in which within which they could then start to manage these relationships because at the moment uh, it's it's very strong and strong-minded individual nation states that are operating in the region China Japan India South Korea so on and so forth. So it, it, as I said, I think the answer almost uh, it has to be tailored to which part of the world you're talking about. Yes, sir. Um, during the Vietnam era, we had the Pentagon Papers. It, it was a leak and it was published by a newspaper. And then recently we had WikiLeaks. What impact are these leaks having on diplomacy, do you think? Yeah. Not good. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I can name the casualties for you. Um, uh, Carlos Pasquale. I mean, okay, Heather, uh, were your cables out there? Is that what got that's Mr. Why got that's why Mr. Correa, Correa kicked you out. There you are. Uh, well, you were in, uh, in, in the illustrious company. It happened to Carlos Pasquale, our ambassador to Mexico, because he wasn't expelled, but he was rendered ineffective. The president said he wouldn't see him anymore. Uh, and he just wasn't being received at the highest levels. Uh, it, our ambassador to Libya, the same effect. Although I, in his case, I don't think it was as problematic because uh, I, mean, we were, I think we ended up pr pretty much withdrawing our senior diplomatic presence uh, anyway. So in seriousness, it's a serious problem because you count on that confidentiality that you, uh, of a conversation that you're going to have with a national leader or with a political opponent of the regime or whatever um, for a reasonable period of time. Uh, most of us are accustomed to a sort of a 20 or 25 year rule before confidential communications are declassified. I don't know what the rule is in Canada, but in the U.S. I think the rule of thumb is 25 years. So that's we publish our foreign affairs series about 25 years after the events occurred. So it's harmful in that respect. And what I would, what I would imagine would happen is uh, if I'm the ambassador, say, to Saudi Arabia, and I have an audience with uh, the monarch, uh, either he's going to be very circumspect in what he says or maybe not want to receive me or more likely he's going to say don't bring all those note takers in there with you and uh, maybe I'll see you privately uh, you know over uh, over a meal or something like that but uh, you know this business of these endless records that you guys keep um, how can I be assured that you're going to keep them confidentially and finally of course uh, we, and I'm sure this has been remedied, we've got to improve the mechanisms for controlling the distribution of some of this stuff. I mean, how a sergeant, I think, in a remote part of Iraq caught his hands on 250,000 State Department communications is a little bit uh, defying of the imagination. So, yeah, it's been harmful. It'll take us a while to recover. Uh, it, uh, uh, I don't think the damage is, is permanent, but it's certainly a not been a highlight of American diplomacy. And John John, normally it's cold and these things come in handy, but <laughs> welcome to warm spring. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Professor Michael Scharf, and I'm the director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center. 
and also the U.S. National Director of the Canada-U.S. Law Institute um, here at CASE. And one really nice thing I can share is that based on a survey of international law professors uh, that was done in the fall, um, U.S. News has just released the rankings of international law programs, and we are up from number 15 last year to number 11 this year. And, and you guys know you're clapping for yourselves because that ranking is based in large part on the spectacular conferences and lectures and speakers that we bring. And many of you here are going to, uh, by your participation in this event, help us, I'm sure, move up even higher in the rankings. Um, we've had some really amazing speakers over the years, but I have to say, uh, John, you're a legend. Um, I, I mean, even when I was a, a young attorney advisor, at the, uh, when, when I was a young attorney advisor at the State Department, um, even then, and, and then since then, your legend has continued to grow. Um, you've added so much luster to this event, and uh, I know we've just clapped three times for him, but one last time, thank you. Tonight. <laughs>